Okay. Um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome you tonight to the first of three lectures in the Digital Tsunami series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ruth Conroy, and I've been organizing these lectures along with my teaching partner, Sheep, who will also be one of the speakers tonight. Um, the title for the whole lecture series is Digital Tsunami, which in, is derived from the Japanese, meaning tidal wave. Um, the series is going to comprise of three lectures, VR and architecture, VR and the city, and tonight's lecture, which we've titled VR and theory. So I just wanted to speak for a couple of minutes about why I actually have a lecture series entitled VR and theory. Well, Sheep and I have been, uh, I was totaling this up today, I think Sheep and I have approximately 10 years experience in VR and architecture between us. And for a long time, most of the cutting edge research within this field has actually focused on the technology itself or how to actually do it. The question of why, why we as, an arch as architects should be interested in VR, in cyberspace, and how this actually relates to other areas in architecture has lagged behind. However, in the last couple of years, there's been a, an explosion in the numbers of papers and books that have been coming out um, <coughs> to do with VR, to do with cyberspace, and particularly to do with uh, how these relate to architecture. So one of the things that we wanted to do with the VR and theory lecture tonight is to create a forum for discussing some of the ideas that are feeding into this embryonic subject area. The first of our speakers tonight, um, who almost needs no introduction whatsoever, is Professor Bill Hillier. Um, to give him his correct title, see if I can get this right, he's Professor of Architectural and Urban Morphology at University College London. He's also Chairman of the Bartlett School of Graduate Studies and Director of the Space Syntax Laboratory at UCL. Um, I imagine that most students here will have come across him uh, through his two books, The Social Logic of Space and his more recent book, Space is a Machine. Um, since, since Sheep and I have been teaching at the AA, I wish I had a pound for every student that's come up to me and boasted of uh, what page in the social, in space in the machine they've managed to get to. It's like this big macho thing, I've got to page 35, or I've got to page 40. So I know that at least a proportion of you will uh, um, have an insight into uh, where Bill's coming from. Um, the other interesting connection is in 1997, I think, the Virtual Reality Center for the Built Environment was set up at the Bartlett School of Graduate Studies. And uh, it's been with great interest that those of us involved in the VR Center have been witnessing the, the influence of some of Bill's theories on the, uh, this area of VR. And, uh, but equally, I think it works both ways. And I hope tonight that we might actually uh, be able to witness the effect that some of these new technologies have been having on Bill's work. Um, so the title of Bill's talk tonight will be Capturing Emergence. Uh, I'll just go on and introduce Sorry. everyone else. The second speaker tonight is Dr. Richard Barbrook. Um, Richard actually was one of the founders of the MA in Hypermedia Studies at Middlesex. <laughs> 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 uh, and I was doing so well in Westminster. <laughs> I thought if I managed to get all of Bill's titles out correctly, everything else would be sort of downhill sailing from there. The course was founded in 1995 and is actually one of the um, leading courses in the country dealing with this area of sort of theories behind cyberspace. Um, Richard was also uh, one of the founding fathers of this group called Cyber Salon and uh, I was begging Richard for a description of what Cyber Salon is. And his description was a floating discussion forum. Uh, and I think we meet about every couple of months. And uh, Richard's also writing a book at the moment entitled The Holy Fools, a critique of the avant-garde in the age of the net. And that's being published by Verso. And finally, Sheep, who describes himself extremely succinctly in the events list as a virtual world builder, lecturer, and programmer. A sheep worked with Bill for many years at the Bartlett and was responsible for writing uh, the majority of the space syntax software um, before setting up the MSc course in virtual environments at the Bartlett. 
uh, which was the first course of its type in the country. He now lectures at the AA and works for a company called Occupy who design 3D virtual worlds for people. Sheep's also working on a book about VR and architecture, which is as, as yet titleless, so suggestions on a postcard, please. Uh, before I hand over to Professor Bill Hillier, I'd like to request that any questions be saved until the end, until after all three speakers have finished, and then we'll open up the floor to a general questions and answers session. So, uh, handing over to Bill. Okay, thanks very much, Ruth. Um, I'm going to talk about capturing emergence. Uh, that, that's a rather cryptic title. Um, and you may wonder what it directly it has to do with virtual reality. Um, and I'm not going to talk about virtual reality in the sense that we're trying to build it in the VR Centre up at UCL. I want to talk about the problem of virtuality in a more general sense, and in particular, the property of virtuality as a property of real systems. I think it's a very, very major problem, including in the study and understanding of space, and the design of space. And like a parson preparing his Sunday sermon, I've got a text to read out from, from Anthony Giddens' book, A Contemporary Critique of Historical Materialism, in the chapter where he talks about the time-space constitution of social systems. And he tries to give an outline of his theory of structuration, which I won't explain in detail, but I, I am interested in just one distinction he makes. He said, first I make a distinction between structure and system. Social systems are composed of patterns of relationships between actors or collectivities reproduced across time and space. Social systems are hence constituted by situated practices. Structures, as opposed to systems, exist in time space only as moments recursively involved in the production and reproduction of social systems. Structures have only a virtual existence. Um, in other words, I want to talk about virtuality in real systems like social systems, and I would argue in, in social systems. But I'll come back once or twice to this quotation from Gibbons. What he's saying is that when we look at society, we see a lot of actors and agents doing things in dispersed locations all over the place. And somehow this is guided by something like some kind of underlying reproducible structure. But no one has any idea what that is, or, 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 where, or, or, or where it comes from, or how we might describe it or capture it. And in fact, the whole theory of structuration is an attempt to try to get some kind of handle on that problem. It also ties up to what one might call the Margaret Thatcher problem of our societies as to whether they exist or not. Because the reason we can't say a society exists in a definite way in the sense that uh, we may believe you know, that an overhead projector or a bottle of fizzy water exists is because there seems to be nothing above the level of, in of the individual which actually can be seen in time and space, which is, what, which is a society and which is something like a structure. So we have this paradox that somehow, as Gidden says, the structure of a society is virtual. At the same time, it seems to run the show, and it seems to go from one generation to the next. It's this problem I'm interested in, but I'm interested in it from a, a particular point of view, my point of view, which is the, from the point of view of spatial systems. Um, I do believe, I suppose, that the reason the sociologists are in the difficulty they are is exactly for the reason that Gibbon says, is that we've be been developing theories of social systems for centuries, which are, represent society in an entirely abstract and no one can actually make the, break, the, the link between this and the, the society as an abstraction, if you like, and the, and the time-space constitution of, of social systems. It's a problem I'm trying to write something about at the moment, but I won't give you the whole question here. I want, do want to try and deal with, the, if you like, the first question, which is how to try to get some handle on virtual structure in, 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 in this kind of system. Now, one problem with this is that structure in the social system, or in the spatial system, is clearly emergent. Uh, spatial systems like London uh, clearly aren't designed by anybody. They emerge from the actions of a very, very large number of actors. But somehow London makes sense. Um, I don't know if any of you have actually read much space in fact, but one of our main ambitions was always to try to understand the structure of very large-scale objects like London. And I suppose what I'm suggesting is that by learning what we have to do epistemologically methodologically to try to understand structure and things like London, I think we get clues to this other important problem of trying to understand virtual structure in systems which are less obviously present in space-time. 
Now, what I'm going to propose is that um, Giddens' problem of trying to describe societies or the structure of societies is, is the more general problem of what I call the strongly relational system. A strongly relational system is one in which the relations among all the elements are more important than the elements themselves. Now, this is a, a fundamental belief of space syntax that uh, a street is a sort of a, you know, sort of a, a, you know, sort of maybe a very nice thing, maybe very, very nice to look at. But what really determines the long-term pathway of that street, what happens on that street, how live or quiet it becomes, what happens on it, is a function of its position in the configuration uh, of the system as a whole. The relations, if you like, of the spatial element are more important than the intrinsic properties of the spatial element, although they have their importance as well. So I'm going to argue that by looking at space, um, space is a strongly relational system. And so is society a strong relational system, and that the relations among elements uh, are more important than the intrinsic properties of elements themselves. Now, the reason we don't know how to describe this, in fact, goes back to one of the oldest problems in philosophy, and that is the problem of describing relations and trying to understand what relations are in general. Um, let me try and describe uh, the way in which uh, Bertrand Russell, in one of his most lucid books, tries to describe it. He says, it, it's quite clear that we can satisfy ourselves as philosophers that London exists, and we can satisfy ourselves that, 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 that Edinburgh exists. And we can say equally definitely that uh, Edinburgh is to the north of London. But the statement that Edinburgh is to the north of London doesn't have any kind of concrete reality to it in anything like the sense. It seems to be an abstraction. It seems to say, well, surely that's a judgment which we make in reference to a lot, a lot of other things, and therefore it's almost a mental act to describe a relationship. And this difficulty goes on, and philosophers can't decide whether relations belong to the real material world or, or whether they belong in minds. And I think neither answer is satisfactory because it seems quite clear that although a relation of being to the north of is not real in the sense that London, London and Edinburgh are real, there is some sense in which we think it's really true, it really is the case, and it seems to have the, the hardness, if you like, of existence of, of an object. There's, this is the problem that philosophers have always faced, and I believe that by learning to handle uh, spatial relationships, then we can deal with something about this. So in fact, what philosophers like Russell are saying is the same thing as Gibbons is saying, relations are virtual. We don't find them in space-time in any kind of concrete form. They seem to be only relations occupying, if you like, the ground between things. Now, that is another reason, apart from this philosophical difficulty, what difficulty, why we find it very difficult to talk about relations. Relations come in complexes. Even something as simple as a, a, a small building is a, a complex of relationships. And we find when we try to talk about this, we don't have anything in the way of language. We try to invent maybe a metaphorical language as architects. We talk about spines or fingers or stars or trying to find ways of characterizing what are relations of space. But when it comes to looking at something like the street pattern of London, we, we, it's hopeless. We've got no kind of language for dealing with anything like that. So we tend to say it's organic or it's haphazard or a product of chance, which it absolutely isn't, by the way. So it has its own interior logic and a very powerful one. But really what we experience in architecture in trying to understand relations is the, the, the problem that philosophers have is that we do not have a way of naming and describing complexes of relations. We can sometimes, all our terms for relations, you know, like inside and between, or the cousin of, or, you know, the, the, the uncle of, are relations which describe immediate relations. But the idea of describing complexes of relations is much more difficult. And where we find complex relational things playing an important role in our lives, like, for example, speaking language, it's clear that underlying the words we use, there are complex relational structures, which we call syntax and semantics and, and grammars and what have you. Now, I suggest that we've only got to think a little bit about how we handle these relational systems that are, are very common in everyday life, to realize that what handles the relational part is our unconscious mind. It's done autonomically. It's part of the low-level learning that Johnson Laird believes is the foundation, if you like, of all uh, later development of cognition. The, the the, uh, the idea of describing relational complexes, like the order in which words belong or the pattern of rooms in a house, is something that intuitively we're very good at. We can grasp straight away. But in terms of trying to put a name to it, we find it much more difficult. I call this the problem of non-discursivity.
There is no language for the description of complexes of relationships. And of course, if we were to develop such a language, we'd be some way, perhaps, to answering Giddens' problem, because if we could describe structures of relationships in a clear and unambiguous way, it might be more easy for us to see that they exist and to bring their virtuality, if you like, from the, the pre their present muzzleness, at least into a clear uh, light of day. Now, the reason I believe that we can approach this through space is that um, if we think of a society as a strongly relational system in, in the way in which Giddens described it, where all the spatio-temporal events are dispersed and sometimes concentrated, but are somehow uh, they're transient in space-time. The, the wonderful thing about human space is it accumulates and formulates and forms very large-scale patterns, which until recently have, have been very baffling. I think, in fact, I don't think it was possible to understand objects as, as complex as London without computers. I mean, no one's intuition is that powerful. We can intuitively deal with small complexes of relations. I think we can intuitively deal with general characteristics of large complexes. But no one has an intuition powerful enough to grasp, uh, if you like, a pattern in very large and complex relational structures as we find in the spatial structure of London. So what I'm going to try and do is to show you that by learning in space, through space, to characterize uh, <coughs> structure in space, and in space, structure is just as virtual almost as it is in social relations, and that we can name the small parts, but we can't uh, name the whole patterns. I'm going to suggest that what space syntax does, the method that I've developed for analyzing large and complex spatial systems, is describe emergent structure in strongly relational systems. And that's what it's for. And I want to show why it does that and how it does that. And there's a particular quirk in the method. Uh, and when we see that, I think we can begin to see not an answer to Gibbons' problem, but the direction in which the answer to Gibbons' problem might lie. Now, those of you who've, who've done some space syntax, I'm going to try and minimize the space syntax content of this, but I have told me that about half of you will be familiar with the basic ideas, which means half won't. So I will have to say something about it, I think, um, and, and, and talk about what I mean by spatial configuration. If I show you what may be a familiar diagram from the sociological space, <coughs> where I take four notional houses, eight-cell houses with a kind of court in them, all with an identical geometry <coughs> to them. Um, and one can represent, if you like, the physical structure in this way, and the space structure as the, as the obverse of that, in order to try and understand it. And if we look at these different pat patterns of, of the interior space, it's quite clear that they're quite different from each other. But it's very hard to build any kind of clear picture of what they are. We, if we imposed a simple geometry, you know, so we could say it has some kind of a simple tree shape or something like that, it would be easier. But patterns like this are almost impossible. They're well beyond our intuition. Uh, on the other hand, dwellings characteristically have houses like this. If you read Julian Hansen's new book, um, Decoding Homes and Houses, she's actually got four examples of real houses which follow almost exactly these models. So the first step in trying to say, well, how do we try to get a handle on what we mean by a complex of space? Well, one thing we can do is to, is to take advantage of the graph. The, the graph is, is really a, a, a way of, gra of describing uh, graphically pure relations. You represent a space as a circle and a relation of permeability, in this case, by uh, a line. And I've added this extra touch that you justify the graph. So you represent the space outside um, by, in fact, he's lost the space outside there. Never mind. Imagine it to be that there's a space outside there as a, uh, <coughs> as, a, as a circle with a cross. And we go in, we find one space here, so we put it one level up. And then we find five more, one level beyond that, and then two more deeper than that. We say, we can see, well, this is what the graph looks like from the outside. And if we take this one, well, that's what the graph there looks like from the outside. This one, the graph looks like that. And each time we find a relationship which between things which we can't draw together. We have to draw these rather long looping things, but all they mean is that there's an entrance connecting one and the other. And here we can find the, uh, again, a very different pattern. By looking at these, we can begin to see the differences in the pattern much more clearly. We can see this is a kind of a shallow tree-like thing. This is rings, everything lies on rings, but they're rather deep. You go through spaces to get to others. This is a much more 
bringing much where all the spaces seem to be much more connected to each other. And this again is a deep tree trunk structure. We can begin to get some kind of um, handle on this. And we can begin to quantify these relationships, of course, as we, as, as we do in space and flex. And I'm not going to show you how we quantify them, but I'm going to show you a very peculiar property, two very peculiar properties of graphs seen that way. The first property is this. Um, here I've drawn a graph of some imaginary spatial relationships in, in a rather messy way, yes? And then I've taken one of the elements, I've taken that element there, and I've justified the graph from there. And it makes this nice, neat, symmetrical pattern. So you can see how I get from there to there. But this connects to those two, those are those ones there. We can be, in other words, we can tidy the graph up. So it, it, it appeals to our geometric and rational imagination, so we can begin to see a pattern which we couldn't see before. Now, the next thing I do is that I take that element there, which actually corresponds to that one there, and I justify it from there. So instead of pulling that one down and seeing what it looks like from there, I start from there, I pull that down, and then it looks like that. It looks entirely different. In fact, this looks sort of nice and tidy and geometric and relatively shallow. This looks like a very deep pattern, indeed. It has very different spatial characteristics. And if you imagine what it would be like having a domestic space you know, with these different kinds of patterns. That would be a very different kind of space. And then I take a third space, I take that one there, and I justify it from there, and we can see it's actually the opposite. We can see everything is very close to there. We can see it's what we call a, a very integrated node in the graph. Now this illustrates one of the first things we have to understand about space. And as space is relational structures, and the relational structures of space are different from different points of view. It's not that they look different, they actually are different when we construct them mathematically from different points of view. And we can quantify these differences. We can quantify the integration value from here, from here, and from here, and they will be very different values. So this, I, I'm going to argue, is a very, very important point about strongly relational systems. What we've done, in fact, is we've found a way of characterizing each point in the graph in terms of its relationship to anything else, rather than in terms of its intrinsic properties of what it's like as a room, what it's like as a space, you know, and all those things, its size or its color and its decor. We're saying, what can we assign values which are purely an expression of its relationship to all the other spaces in the system? So that's one property. Spaces are different in systems according to the point of view from which we look at them. Secondly, again, now I come back to this graph here, right? And I'm going to take away one of the relationships here and put another one in over here. And then I'm going to do the same thing again. So this one then becomes like that. This one becomes like that, and this one becomes like that. In other words, when I change one value, one element in the system, I move a link from here to there, then we find that all the configurational properties of the system change. All these numbers, which represent how sh shallow or deep the graph is from that point, we can see that when we change that, all these values change with respect to that, and all these values change with respect to that. So what I'm saying is that not only does a space is different from different points of view in a complex, but when we change a part, we tend to change the whole. But we don't know that we do. We often do. Sometimes we change a part. And how much we change is a very crucial part of this. Now, what this implies is that all spatial structures are emergent. It means that if we take a house or an area of London and block a door, we change all the values of space in the, in the, in the complex. If we cut off a particular road, then we change the whole potential flows of movement in that area. And this sort of thing is, 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 is back to traffic engineers uh, for many years. Now the result is that when we look at um, those original little houses I showed you, we can see that, in fact, we can see that we can look at them from different points of view and see different patterns. We can begin to exploit this. For those of you who know space syntax, know that we can immediately apply this to the houses. We can take a, a notional representation of a house like this, justify it from the outside, from a major space, from a different space, and we can begin to see, we can begin to quantify the properties, if you like, of that space from the point of view of the rest of the house. And we can begin to build up pictures where we can show, as we can, consistencies in the way in which different activities in the house, like in this case, the cell commune, is the most integrated space. And that means it's the space where there's most likely to be movement, there's most likely to be connection to everything else. And by looking at this, we can begin to see that this method of justifying the graph, the J-graph as I call it, allows us to quantify things in a purely relational way and to give a spatial meaning to the idea of function, to, the, to say the function of cooking, the function of 
entertaining, the function of sleeping, the function of bathing, the function of entertaining informal friends. All of these turn out to have different ways of being embedded into the graph. And in doing this, we can begin to build pictures of domestic space. We can actually sort of actually look at the whole samples. This is a sort of a taken from a recent PhD study of all the houses in Turkey. All these represent the different regions, and these represent the differences in these computations, but all the different functions in the house. So this is, if you like, a, a pattern, a functional pattern within a household. We can see that in certain areas uh, of the country, it's, it's similar to others, and in others it's different. So this is how space syntax works. So when we take something much more complex, like London, and take the, instead of taking the, the spaces as elements, we take the lines as elements, we can see that it produces, if you like, simply by what we've done here in, in coloring this up, is simply taking each point, each line here, represented it as a graph, and computed its graph distance from all the other elements. And simply the, in this configurational way, it picks up Oxford Street as the most integrated space, then through the orange and yellow ones, the blue ones are the least integrated. You can see that it picks up the whole pattern of London, you know, the, the main ways in and out, the informal routes by which you go from Chalk Farm to Clax Lane and wander across London. It picks up all these things, and it picks up a great deal of the land use pattern which has been developed here. Somehow it picks up the, this way of looking at something like London allows us to identify a structure simply by this principle of looking at it from all its point of view and saying, well, how does the rest of the system look from this point of view? And more importantly, how does the rest of the point of view, the rest of the system relate to this particular point of view in which I'm looking at it? So London is an emergent structure, but it turns out that it has a, 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 a deep rationality to it, which affects not only the, the pattern of uh, um, lines, which influences a pattern of movement, and this turns out to the pattern of integration influences land uses. I mean, the, the shops are in Oxford Street because originally natural movement generates movement down there, so the shops go there. And this whole pattern, if you like, activates the grid configuration as it evolves, activates the whole pa pattern of densities and land uses that eventually characterizes a city like London as a kind of a seamless web of busy and quiet areas with apparent intelligibility and apparent easy ways of understanding the relationships between each, in spite of the fact that it doesn't have any geometrical order to it. Now let me clarify absolutely what we've done here, what, what, what's going on, because one of the things about space is that there, there, what saves space, space is non-discursive, impossible to understand intuitively when it gets too complicated, but it is lawful. The great thing that saves space, I don't, I don't think it's not offensive to utter the word lawful in these hello walls, but um, <laughs> Um, I assure you space is lawful, and I can easily demonstrate it some of its laws. But let me show you one of them here. Um, I have to be on a rather small scale. But this is an experiment showing emergence and emergent structure, not only in the building, but how it then influences the functional pattern of that building. What I've done is I've drawn a little simple cell with an entrance, which I've drawn by a little line here, okay? And then I've developed, a, I've, I've generated um, uh, Way, which I'm joining other similar cells on. I, I, every time I join a cell on, I have to take the permeability out of the original cell and feed it to the outside world. That's all I have to do. It's a simple rule. I've got a room with an entrance, so I stick a, an, another cell on, I make a, 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 a make a hole in the wall, and I feed another, another one to the outside. You can imagine dozens of different ways of doing this. I just want to show the effect of this one. So otherwise, this process is a random process, and you can do it how you like, okay? And you can see that as it grows, it begins to make a very, very definite form. It begins to form courtyards. If we allow the courtyards to close, we can also not allow them to close and have an extra rule. And eventually we find, infallibly, that the, this particular set of generating rules will make this multi-level, multi-courtyard structure with a very particular pattern of internal permeability. Um, I don't know if any of you have read Shaw Stedman's recent uh, article in the Journal for the Environment, Planning B, in which he proposes that there is an art Archetypical building, um, and it has a remarkable re resemblance to this. So, though Stedman's reasoning is in fact very different from the reason here, but one day maybe we'll find that these uh, two sets of ideas converge. So, here we've got, if you like, a, a structure of a physical structure of a building and a structure of space. Here is the sort of structure of the building, and here is the structure of space. What I've done, in fact, is I've assumed that 
one can go linearly and all the entrances are central. So you, you make, make actually, if you like, a pattern of permeability that you can go in. By the way, uh, UCL is based on this particular pattern. You know, and it used to be easy to demonstrate until they closed half the building down when the versus department got an overactive thyroid and put you about the organization's face. So what I've done with this pattern here is I've done a space syntax analysis of it. I've simply done what I've done all along. And I've taken, you know, I've, I've justified that I've just taken each of these lines as, as the nodes of a graph, and I've justified the graph from each point, and I've done my computation of integration from there. And we can see, although this thing is growing completely randomly, apart from its rule, it has a very powerful internal structure now. Now we know from research that this particular analysis of structure is a powerful determinant of movement. So what we're seeing is not only that by a simple generative process, if you like, a building structure emerges, but also a, a, a functional potentiality emerges, which may not be realized because it may be used for entirely different purposes. But other things being equal, if people just go into this building and start wandering around, then the rates of movement are together reflect the colors of these lines to a remarkable degree. Now, let's, let's clarify what we've done, because um, I, what I want to argue is that this method of the justifying graph, this idea of looking at a strongly relational system like space um, from each point of view and saying, how does it look? Uh, how does the system look from here? And how do I look from the rest of the system? <coughs> is a method which does actually capture emergent structure in strongly relational systems. And I'm going to suggest that it also gives a concrete meaning to what otherwise would seem virtual. I say if we see a pattern like this, we would be inclined to think that the, the building is a physical structure, but the pattern of space is almost like a virtual thing because we don't experience it all at once. I mean, for me, I think the word virtual, as it's used today, tends to me mean not realized in space-time all at once at the level at which we name it. We, we name an entity, and if we can't find it in one place in space-time, if it's dispersed, like a virtual community on the internet. We're not saying these other guys don't exist in South America. What we're saying is they don't exist in the same space-time frame. So I think all space is like that to some extent. And so what we see is that this is the method of J-graphs, as I call it, the method of looking at a system from its constituent points of view and analyzing the relationship to every other system gives us a handle on the non-discursivity of relational complexes. And space syntax research is entirely based on this, and everything that we've done is uh, how long are we on? Three minutes? Five minutes? Three minutes. Huh? In that case, I'll give you one of my examples, not the other thing. Okay. Now, ha I, I can't apply this to societies, but I am interested in, um, in a particular problem. I'm interested in sort of how we, we do it in principle. And one of the things that's always fascinated me is, you know, if, if one reads the whole sort of history of um, of uh, attempts in the 20th century to come to terms with notions of culture and society. The name of Levi Strauss is, is, is one that looms large. One of Levi Strauss's beliefs, um, uh, because he studied you know, pre-industrial societies, um, the best place that he expresses this is in, in, in an interview with George, what's his name, Charbonnier, um, um, in which he talks about um, modern societies being like steam engines, you know, the inequalities sort of create, um, if you like, tremendous energy and change. But he says primitive societies are like clockwork. They have these crystalline structures, you know, which sort of are reversible and sort of go on forever. They just reproduce themselves. And this is a very, very influential idea. And if we want to understand big societies, I suppose we do have to understand small societies first. Until people like Liam de Vore came along and actually did studies of the simplest societies on the planet, uh, people like the, the, the Eastern Hadza in, in, in Africa, and, uh, there was a, in the 1970s there was a wonderful seminar where all these studies were brought together in Levi Strauss's name, but unfortunately showing that Levi Strauss was completely wrong because the more primitive and the more uh, simple societies were, then the, the less crystalline structure they seemed to have. The more they, for example, simple um, uh, hunter-gathering societies that were investigated didn't even have stable groups. People changed groups frequently, sometimes daily, almost. There was a kind of a continual shuffling of people. Like we shuffle cards, we ought to think about why do we shuffle cards so the game doesn't become too predictable. Maybe we shuffle people for the same reason. 
the people shuffling was one of the clear mechanisms, and the society would disperse at certain times of the year and form groups, which were always centered around a, 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 an apical woman, a sort of central woman, and going from one group to another always used some kind of family relationship. But you saw this continual sort of exchange of people. Now, that, this is very difficult for, because Levi Strauss would have hoped that one day we would be able to describe these crystalline structures. And you could do one of his nice diagrams you know, in, his, in his books and say, this is the sort of structure in Montana of a society. But how on earth do you create a, a picture? What is the society if people don't belong to groups but continually exchange groups? Um, they don't have a territory in any real sense. They have a place in which they operate. They don't have a concept of, of territoriality. They, it, for part of the year, they're in dispersed groups. Another part, they live in... Um, it, they come together and form much bigger groups. And all the social habits change, and all the social mores change, the social rules change when you're in a dense group. And then you go off again and you live in a, a different way. This seems, it's completely inconsistent. Now, what interests me is say, well, can, this, this sounds like, it sounds like Gibbon's problem, you know, how do you describe the, the virtual structure and a thing like that? And it sounds like the existence problem. How do you name what is the society, what do these guys think society is? Um, when they name it, when they name themselves as being this. It can't just be rituals, because this is just a means of creating these patterns, these dispersed patterns, that um, we somehow have to capture the logic of. But yet, clearly, this thing projects itself through time. It has a, a certain pattern to it. So supposing this is just a purely idiotic experiment. So basically, we simply take the idea of random groups, sort of groups, not, not in any kind of spatial way. These can be sort of anywhere. And then develop the idea but um, overlap of the people means that they're a member of the same spatial group. And when a line goes from one to the other, it means that that person is someone you know you're related to. So you, the line, if you like, carries a relationship across space. And I draw one of the circles larger because that's the ethical woman. So all, each of these groups has this. So we can see that you know, this begins to happen. Well, of course, once we have this, something like that, a, a complex structure, we can actually analyze it um, as a graph. We can actually look at it like this, and do my little integration analysis. Uh, and this shows that at this stage, after these number of transactions, we've got uh, people with different degrees of integration into the, into the social fabric. And also, we see the groups. This is a very blue group, which means it's rather poorly connected. This is a, a, a bigger and, and redder group, which just means it's more integrated into the whole thing. And then we can have some more random changes. And we can see, as the thing goes on, at every stage, we can begin to see how this happens, we can sort of, um, we can not only, if you like, see that as time goes on, the colorings of the individuals and the colorings of the group is changes. We can actually then compute the value of a group, and so we can color up the groups and see that all these relationships hold. We can let the, the relationships die, if you like, after two moves or something like that, to, um, or two generations. So we can see this kind of pattern beginning to emerge, and then we change around again. Once again, we can see that you know, the pattern of individuals shifts. But there's always, if you like, a, a certain pattern of inequalities in cultures. And it seems to me that simply by applying this method, what we're doing is we're saying at every stage we keep a track of the individual and the relationships to all the others. But look at the relation of proximity and a kin relation and the relation of going across space. We can begin to build a picture of what it is that these people project through space-time. Really, it's the maintenance, if you like, of the underlying principles of that pattern, which allows us to do this kind of thing. Now, I'm not suggesting we can apply anything as simple as that to a modern society, but I do suggest that when we're trying to answer Gibbon's problem of finding a way to capture the, if you like, the virtual structures of emergent systems, then I, my belief is this is the way to do it, that the way to handle any strongly relational system um, is this. Now, I'm going to stop now, but I'm going to tell you what I was going to do, but I'm not going to um, And that is that, um, as I'm here, um, is that I also believe that the realm of what we call the aesthetic, in, in the broadest sense, you know, of how we, um, I think that this also may yield something to this kind of analysis. I think the, the realm of the aesthetic is the nature of a strongly relational system brought into a single time space frame. I think this is what we mean. The, some of the work that I'm doing, and some of the work Ruth has been interested in, is actually trying to find ways of looking at things like buildings and complexes of buildings as we see them as strongly relational systems, 
with the idea that the patterns that we see and the way in which we understand them, the way in which we pick up, make discriminations about them, the way in which we interpret notions like symmetry and an opposite thing, which I believe I can calculate, called counter-symmetry, which is meant to be the opposite of symmetry. I believe that these also have the nature of strongly relational systems, but not in the same sense as society is, but in the sense that, that the elements we bring together, what we mean by composition art in architecture, is bringing things into certain kinds of relationships. And the way to analyze this is to look at all each part and look at its relationship to all the other things, using the kind of language and methods I'm suggesting. And I believe this does begin to yield something about how we understand buildings, how it is we can look at buildings, and get some kind of sense that we understand what they are, and also get some kind of sense of, of um, you know, the thing that, uh, that buzzes, if you like, above recognizing what a building does. I think that there are ways in which we can bring tensions into these relationships, which allow us to, if you like, offer a substitute for the, if you like, the old classical theory that, 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 that simple um, arithmetical proportions or simple ge geometrical ideas underlie the idea of, of harmony or beauty in buildings. I mean, that is obviously wrong because it, in some cases it's true, but what about all the others that don't? Whereas this kind of method, I think, can allow us to pick out a much more varied set of patterns uh, which are accessible to our intuition at, and which I believe that um, we can begin to explain to some extent as, as structure, virtual structure in strong relational systems. I'm off. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, as I said, if we can hold any questions towards, uh, towards the end when all three speakers are finished. And I'll pass swiftly on to Dr. Richard Barbrook. Hi. I find, I find it very ironic coming to um, address a, uh, a gathering of architects because one of the key things I want to say today is precisely that cyberspace is not a space um, in, the most, in the sense that has just been talked about. Um, the late great Henri Lefebvre showed that the historical production of space is an essential part of creating a modern society. However, the net is a very good example of, in fact, how part of the production of modern society has been about getting rid of space. And what I want to talk about is how the social relations between people within the net are based around this very fact. And the fact the reason why we talk about cyberspace as a description for the net is a good example of how often we look, think about new technologies in inappropriate ways because we refer them to old technologies. And a good example of this is radio. Originally, radio was seen as wireless telegraphy, that is, point-to-point -point communication. And yet, it's one of its major social impacts has actually been one-to-many communication as broadcasting. And in fact, the term wireless telegraphy in, in many ways inhibited people from understanding one of the really powerful uses of this new technology, which was not to broadcast to a single person or a single receiver, but to many different people. And in part, and one of the problems that we've had with understanding the net and the use of spatial metaphors to understand the net has been precisely this, if you like, uh, projection of previous technologies and previous social relationships onto this new phenomenon of the net. Now, if we think about where cyberspace came from, it was invented by William Gibson for the book Neuromancer. And as Gibson himself admits, at the time he had no computer, let alone a net connection. He wrote Neuromancer on a manual typewriter. And he got the idea of cyberspace from watching people play in arcades video games. And for those of you who have PlayStations or N64s, you know that the, the latest wave of video games in the last 10, 15 years has been precisely to create an illusion of 3D. Similarly, many uh, other science fiction projects, we think of the film Tron or we think of a book like Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, sees the world of the computer as this 3D model. And in fact, if you, in both Tron and in Snow Crash, part of the story is ideas like a chase. So you are actually trying to race against somebody in a virtual 3D environment. The problem with this is, of course, that you're, again, you're taking existing ideas where we live now 
in this sense that people talk about virtual reality, you'll take existing reality and try to create a facsimile, a simulation of it. And of course this is particularly powerful when it's, a, when it's projected as Americans because of their long-standing fascination with the idea of the conquest of new territories. I mean, here is a country that was founded by the ethnic cleansing of its original population. And the Wild West has remained as a central metaphor, the frontier metaphor. And you can see this the way, for instance, the, uh, one of the major pressure groups for civil rights on the net actually calls itself the Electronic Frontier Foundation with no sense of irony we always ask, who are the Indians if this is the electronic frontier? So the spatial metaphors have been very powerful in the net and many people, we can think of the development of the people who work on VRML, we can think of, uh, of uh, community spaces like the palace where people have tried to create within the net an expression of a virtual space. And yet the net is a very good example of a much longer process which is to do exactly the opposite. As Karl Marx says in the Grundrisse, one of the central driving forces of industrialization is the elimination of space by time. Here is a man who's living in the British Empire, constructed by naval communications, and of course living at the time when the introduction of the first real-time communications at a distance, the telegraphy system, which was absolutely central to the construction and managing of the British Empire. And so what he was talking about is that if we want to coordinate people together, both on a national and a global level, one of the key things we want to do is not, not to create alternative spaces, but to actually go beyond space, to create something that's a non-space. And so we can see this, actually. Anybody who uses the net knows that, in fact, the, the spatial metaphor is a very poor one within the net. We are presented usually with a flat screen, and what it is is linking from document to document, program to program, object to object. And often we are unaware that we've moved from somewhere in Germany to somewhere in America to somewhere in Australia to somewhere in China by just going from link to link to link. And one of the promises of the net is precisely that it allows us to overcome that spatial barrier. We can communicate with people. We can, we can talk with a group of people who are actually spatially dispersed on a global level. The elimination of space by time. Uh, and so in a sense, it's outside geographical limits. Now, obviously, within the net, within the infrastructure, the architecture, net, there are spatial limitations. People who try to access websites when the transatlantic wires are full realize that there is a spatial limitation. But for most of us, and most of the time you're using the net in an active sense, the spatial metaphor is incredibly weak. And one of its appeal, most appealing factors is precisely this it allows us to overcome the spatial metaphor. And we can see this, that if one of the hypes about the net is, and I said the false uh, dreams about the net, is that it's an alternative space, it's a new place to be conquered uh, for companies or for people to homestead as this wonderful phrase on, the, on cyberspace. One of the other fantasies about the net is precisely this idea that somehow we will become free not just of space but even of our physical bodies. We get this idea like in Michael Himes' work that we can somehow live as spirits within cyberspace. Other people think that cyberspace itself, the net, is creating God according to John Perry Barlow. It's a collective consciousness. And so we can see that, in a sense, these two metaphors clash against each other because they're both trying to grasp that we've created a communication system that is global, it's real-time, and that it's, in some sense, is offering us a way of overcoming some of these limitations. And so what I want to talk about today is how, if you, if you can, for the... Again, we have to remember that 50% of the world's population haven't made a phone call, so we're talking about, a, even now, a relatively small percentage of the population in industrial countries, less alone in the world. How that, those people who have access to the net can use the net to create community groups, what are called virtual communities, network communities, online communities. And part of what they're trying to do is to, in a sense, 
create these social relationships precisely without the restriction of space. In a way, if you like, if Henri Lefebvre sees that space is an integral part of creating modern social relationships, in a sense what the net is promising is that you can create social relationships between people without that physical limitation and the historical baggage that's embodied in that space. Of course, the best example of this is if you read the utopian texts <coughs> of old hippies like Howard Rheingold who talk about the virtual community. And for them, the virtual community is something entirely new. It's partly a way of compensating for precisely the fragmentation of society they experience on the West Coast. As people have pointed out, California is the place which people have emigrated to twice, first to America and then to California. And in particular, of course, against the highly commercialized culture which has developed alongside Silicon Valley and the other high-tech industries. And so for people like Rheingold, this virtual community, this network community, is the opposite of the commercial American society in which they live. As they talk about it, it's the lost commons. As America was not a commons after the Europeans arrived, um, this is a strange metaphor, but nonetheless what it sees as is, a, is that it's a place precisely because it, it's freed from the limitations of American space that you can create a utopian society. And in a sense what they're doing is reflecting the places where they themselves are coming from. Within the academy, within the university system, of course the primary method of socialization of labor, how you make, make it within the system, is actually not through the market, not through the commercial system, but in fact through the gift economy of the ac academy. You give a paper at a conference, you present an article, and so on and so forth. And also, of course, within the legacy of the new left of the West Coast, who again, the hacker, the hacker ethic of information wants to be free, means that literally, an ethic of shareware, freeware, and of circulation of gifts, which is right at the key of the net and its development. And so for them, the net becomes a place that's not a space, not California, not commercial culture. Now, in a sense, what's, what they've done is that they've taken this new technology, the net, and said that certain promises of the 60s and the new left, things that were partially successful in West Coast culture and in the European context, can now be fully realized within this new technology, these networks that have been created. So if we look back to, say, the critique of established not just commercial media but also public service media in the 60s, people like Guy Debord and the media activists who were inspired by situationism said the distinction is between mainstream media, which is a spectacle, that is, it's designed to be passively consumed by the audience. Uh, they cannot participate, they must accept what is broadcast at them, and what we want to do is create new forms of expression, uh, uh, video, radio, and interestingly, if you read lots of this stuff, they also predicted computer networks could do this, where instead of it being a spectacle, it would be an agora, that is, using the metaphor of ancient uh, Athens, it would be a place where people could directly communicate with each other and produce that and circulate their own opinions with each other. In other words, it would be centered not on passive consumption, but interactive participation. But uh, crucially, in this network, though it uses metaphors like agora, a physical space where people can talk to each other, the whole point is that it's not a space. If you go on to a network community, it presents itself as a series of pages, basically, which you can log on to and either communicate people in real time, but often just by leaving messages, by communicating with each other. So what's important about this un understanding of network communities and how they are being constructed is, as I said, is that precisely because they are not a space that people have been able to think of themselves 
in this, in fact, quite utopian way. Ideas that in the 80s went, um, are either marginalised or, in fact, discredited. We can think of people like Baudrillard, who in the 70s was the most enthusiastic advocate of community media, and, again, someone who forecast that commu computer networks would create direct democracy, uh, replace capitalism with a, la uh, a time of permanent play. Within, by the 80s, they were exactly the people who had denounced their previous utopian thoughts about the potential of community media and new technologies. They became the people who, you know, Baudrillard said that it's precisely interactivity in the media that removes political participation. If you're looking at a screen, you can't be participating politically. And yet what the net has done is sent revived these old new left ideas, but projected them onto a new technology. However, what I want to talk about is that, in fact, the important thing about the net has not, is, again, just as cyberspace, in a sense, is a blind metaphor, the belief that the net is creating direct democracy, a utopia, a post-capitalist, post-commercial, uh, a, a perfect zone which is beyond the everyday, in a sense misses the power and the point of the net. What the net is, is being when it, the, the power of the net is precisely when it's moved from these early adopters, the people who, like um, Howard Rheingold, who and the other utopians who have created a lot of the discourse in which we analyse the net, to it actually becoming part of everyday life. Buckminster Fuller once said that a technology is only really successful when it's transparent, when it disappears, when we don't even think about it. We don't even think about electric lights, telephones, televisions, all these things that were, in previous generations, radical leaps forward. And so one of the interesting things about the present work and what people are looking at in network communities is in fact how they've relocated these networks back into space, but it's a social, historical space. In a sense, this is where the fair comes back in again. And thinks that these groupings of people who are using the network are now not trying to create something that's outside really existing society, but to integrate it back into society in the same way as other technologies are. It becomes an enabling technology. And so one of the key powerful things of the network communities at the moment is that it's reinforcing communications within people. And if you, can, you, know, if you look at the commercial uses of the net, what is it mainly being used for? Things like intranets to actually create communications within companies. On top of that, of course, there are unofficial type internets where people are using it to talk about work issues, to help each other out, basic things like programming, but also to actually just socialise with each other, to show solidarity. Of course, the other great use of the net in a community sense has been around leisure activities. The net is the most amazing publication of fanzine literature in human history, where almost any obsession you can think of, there is a website devoted to. Also, of course, there are other social community groups. What we could group, and um, the old community media used to talk, distinguish between what they called local communities and communities of identity. And again, people who, are in, who identify them in different ways, in different ways, rather than ethnicity, sexuality, age, or whatever, again, use the net to reinforce and uh, develop these senses of identity. And let us not forget, when we're talking about, the, if you like, the reinsertion of the net back into everyday life and working life, is in fact locality. Some of the most successful network communities have actually been highly localised. Now, some, a friend of mine worked with a, something called Digital City in Amsterdam, and one of its key things was that they decided right from the beginning that it would only be in Dutch. Yeah? which immediately excluded most of the net because it's in this strange language that they speak. And this important thing with this was that it create, it was, it's actually based particularly, of course, on Amsterdam culture and the various community, artistic and other political groupings involved in Amsterdam. So it's re been used to reinforce existing work and friendship and community networks within a particular legality. And so... What we have to say is that the, 
in a sense that what's interesting for me and exciting about the net is precisely that we're coming to the end of cyber hype. That we are at the end of this stage where the net is promising us either liberation from the body or uh, creating God out there somewhere through the networks or even that we're somehow creating new communal structures within the net which are somehow different from the ones that we exist in now. Uh, that it's become integrated into our lives. But this means that though they might, we might use space, we might understand how these communities are created spatially by work, by locality, by uh, interests. What we must understand is the fact that the, why the net is powerful is precisely because it allows us to overcome those limitations. And what's more, it particularly allows us to do it in more advanced and sophisticated ways. And for me, one of the interesting things about this is how precisely the net is not another particular hype, cyber hype, which is one of the key things that has been promoted, particularly by Wired magazine, of course, is that the net is somehow a perfect marketplace where everybody will buy and sell with each other. It's precisely because the net is about people communicating by creating network communities that in fact at the centre of the net is not the exchange of goods for money. It is not a commodity money economy, it is a gift economy. And we can see this in not just fanzine publication but the whole phenomenon of the way that people are circulating information between each other for free. There was um, yesterday on Channel 4 News they had somebody from the record industry and they said that the most popular word entered into search engines now after sex is mp3 now for those of you who don't know what mp3 it's, an, it's a way of, uh, of um, encoding music so it can be sent across the net so you can get those basically you can download CDs for nothing and partly of course they're worried about existing copyright material going into being pirated bootleg but also, particularly they're worried about, which they won't admit, is that lots of people never bother to copyright their music in the first place. That it's created an entirely gift economy where pe musicians are circulating their produ productions with each other. And we know how this cuts with phenomena like sampling, DJing, remixing and all the rest of it. And so, just to finish, one of, the, one of my favourite um, phenomena is when I go... Uh, when I go to America to speak, I always like to say congratulations to the United States because at the height of the Cold War, they were the first country to successfully build communism. That is, a post-capitalist, post-commodity economy, and it's called the Internet. The network communities associated together through this wonderful Cold War technology. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and uh, just uh, it might take a sort of a minute or so to swap over as Sheep's going to be the only high tech of our three speakers and actually uh, use a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hopefully this will be quite swift. I only agreed to do this because I could use Ruth's laptop. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, what my purpose in talking was to try and uh, somehow join what Rich was saying to what Bill was saying. And so I had to sit there and kind of speculatively, uh, speculatively guess what both sides were going to talk about and then uh, try and do something about it. And I think my screen's got a bit small. Um, 
And so I thought I'd start off with this. Nothing? No? Ah, for those of you who missed the football. Actually, screen for a long time. Try and switch things over. This one I call blue. Um, no, don't seem to be getting anything. Oh well, let's go back in. Ah, we're there. Um, I had to start off with um, my other favourite description of uh, cyberspace, which um, is attributed to many people. I think the people I'd, I like to attribute to is uh, Mondo 2000. Cyberspace is where you are when you are on the phone. And um, uh, what I'd start, like to start off with is Eula. And I've got a real problem with my screen size today, haven't I? <laughs> Quick, quickly readjust talk. Um, Leonard Euler, uh, born in 77, a mathematician. And um, what was interesting, he was actually a brilliant mathematician that covered many f uh, interesting areas of mathematics. But the one area that I found most interesting, from, uh, most interesting was that he, he invented this subject known as graph theory. And he invented it due to um, uh, uh, a question that was floating around polite society of the town of Kronzberg. And um, uh, it was actually quite interesting. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand what, what the uh, statement was originally until I realised that um, uh, 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 historically, the uh, the well-to-do of the city would actually uh, would actually take urban walks. They would actually just walk around the city, much like the uh, the English uh, uh, country elite now like to go out to the countryside and take long walks. At that point, the uh, the uh, urban elite would actually like to take nice walks through the city, and that's what they do in the evening as, as part of their uh, uh, part of their entertainment, also part of their social network building. And one of the questions that had, mer had emerged, if I can grab the uh, laser, I get to all zap you as well, it's great, was, um, uh, as you can see, uh, Kronzberg had uh, two islands and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bridges. And the question they were asking themselves was, OK, well, every night we go out and uh, we'd like to walk around the city in such a way that we actually end up where we started from. We cross each bridge, bridge once, because obviously you don't want to cross the, cross the bre same bridge twice because you've been there once already. And uh, we get back to where we started from. <coughs> and the question is, could we do this? And a lot of people have actually tried walking around different routes. And uh, uh, for, for over 50 years, people have kind of said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure if you actually go up this one first, or maybe if you start from the middle and go out, then you can do it. And uh, what Euler did after three days of thinking about this problem was uh, reduce the city down to this. Oh, okay. So he said, okay, well, in fact, the island, um, this is the starting point in the island. So there's a starting point there, there's a starting point out here, there's a starting point over here, and a starting point here. And each bridge represents a route between these starting points. Um, and then he took that and further simplified it down to this, which you can't see because, of course, it's all off for some reason. Oh, no, that's going up. Bill was right. He should, I should have gone slide. Okay. <laughs> Never no, trust the machinery. Um, <laughs> now, what was interesting was he actually created this whole branch of mathematics based on this problem, which is known, n now known as graph theory, uh, uh, which might be better termed publicly termed network theory. Um, basically, he proved mathematically it was impossible to walk around this journey to cross each bridge once uh, and only once and end up where you started. And he could show that that was uh, completely impossible from all starting points. Um, now, that was... Uh, uh, what I found it was quite interesting was that, of course, for hundreds of years, the Hoi of Kronzberg didn't realise they were using a graph. Um, and that their, their whole um, city structure could actually be reduced down to a simple uh, uh, graph network structure. Much as people later on didn't realise, and this is, again, a picture of a brain. What is going wrong? This is not fair. Let's try changing... Let's try that. 
Oh, it looks great here now. You have to come around. Uh, let me just fiddle for a second. Yeah, well, it's not, it's actually in director, stupidly. Uh, always center. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back. And it's still off. Great. <coughs> Joy of joys. Because it's set to the left of the screen. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. I can't as well. No. Oh well, who cares? <laughs> you do, but I don't care. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> since Euler's time, people, uh, uh, the, the other popular pastime of that period was actually going to an uh, anatomical expositions. Uh, our word theatre actually comes from uh, the, the, the surgical word for theatre and the uh, word for the uh, uh, theatre, theatre, actually come from the same basis, which is basically one of the fun things to do, apart from walking around Krautsburg, uh, uh, trying to work out when you can walk on the bridges, was going to ha see someone being cut up. It's like, oh, who's been cut up tonight? Oh, apparently there's this like, dead guy who's like, uh, uh, got a really interesting disease. Oh, great, let's go and see that. Um, it was either that or East Enders, I think. Uh, now, what was interesting, of course, was that um, uh, eventually, with the invention of the microscope, people uh, discovered the structure of the brain, the anatomical structure of the brain, consisted of uh, essentially two elements. Basically, your brain, the grey matter in your brain is, consists of a large number of cells. And the cells have two parts, the axons, the fingers, uh, these long dendrites sticking out from them, and the neurons, the central neuron. Okay. And the question that kind of uh, uh, came out of this was that how can thinking arise from the, the activity of these cells? After all, basically what happens is the function of an individual cell is incredibly simple and incredibly straightforward. The axions act as kind of sensors. If enough axions are excited by other neurons, a message goes down the axions to the neuron. And eventually the uh, neurons get to a certain level of hype and uh, the axions get to a certain level of input hype that the neuron itself then gets excited and then fires all its axions, okay? And then the pattern carries on. Very simplistic. The, but the essential question that, uh, uh, that, that troubles um, uh, neurologists is, well, how does this thing we think of as consciousness arise out of the simple, simple electrical processing of uh, uh, the brain's patterns? Okay, there's a bit of chemistry in there which I'm going to briefly, because uh, 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 I've only got 20 minutes to go through. Uh, uh, briefly skip over. But essentially, uh, uh, it's a very mechanical process, and yet ourselves, our brains, the hoi polloi of Krautsberg, their consciousness arises out of this interaction over the network which forms our brains. Um, <laughs> finally, come to the clipped picture of Ted Nelson. Um, now, what Ted Nelson, um, who I, I personally regard as the uh, father of the internet, He's the father of the, of the concept of hypertext, not internet, hypertext. And um, what Ted Nelson suggests in, in books like Computer Lib and slightly uh, other more scientific works is that the way the brain holds information, or rather so, typically society is dominated by the way we work. We either speak, and we tend to speak in sentences, and we tend to have interaction, but we tend to actually have long kind of patterns coming out. Alternatively, we write. And again, writing was a technology he felt that had actually constrained the way we work, particularly constrained the way we think. He goes, uh, this was something that's particularly emerging out of the whole field of artificial intelligence. People early on in artificial intelligence thought, hey, look, neurons, they're really simple things. They're on, they're off, they kind of excite, they excite each other. Building a brain can't be that difficult after all. And you had all this kind of real 60s hype about electronic brains. Um, and everyone felt, oh my God, we're all going to be replaced. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but one of the interesting, uh, one of the interesting uh, outputs of this was that uh, people like Marvin Linsky, that they came up with <coughs> statements like, okay, to understand a simple concept li like uh, uh, Napoleon died on Mount St. Helens, um, uh, uh, Wellington was saddened. Okay, how many concepts does that involve? Well, it's a short sentence. 
It doesn't require that many concepts. Surely it can't require that many concepts. But then, of course, you need the concept of, okay, uh, Napoleon. What was Napoleon? He was a general. What's a general? A general is a guy that runs lots of soldiers and organises them. Okay, what's a, what's a soldier? It's a guy who fights for a general. No, we can't have that as a contradiction. Okay, so what's a soldier? He's a guy who fights for a country. What's a country? A country is a collection of people. Okay, so you're sitting there, and if, you actually, uh, and if you're trying to build an artificially intelligent machine, you have to sit there and describe exactly what all these concepts are to the machine. Okay? And you go, okay, so what's a country? It's, uh, it's a kind of collection of people. Uh, it's like, okay, right. Um, uh, what about an island? Well, an island is a body of water that's surrounded, uh, you know, it's a body of land surrounded by water. What's a constant? It's also a body of land surrounded by water. Oh, so what's the difference? Uh, well, um, uh, I know there's a difference somewhere. <laughs> now, th this is something that's actually quite prevalent in, uh, in kind of library studies, which is where do you put something? So what they're trying to do in library studies is actually trying to flatten the hierarchy. They're trying to create a simple hierarchical method, right, where everything fits inside something else. What Ted Nelson suggested was that uh, concepts themselves are not hierarchical. There aren't super concepts and lesser concepts and sub concepts. There isn't, there isn't such a natural hierarchy. In fact, all concepts relate to all other concepts forming a network. So he said that um, the, uh, uh, a concept, uh, what the computers allow us to do with hypertext is to create the conceptual machine, a machine in which uh, concepts can be linked by, uh, by links to other concepts. Okay. But that makes the concept of a hypertext quite strongly difficult from the concept of a text. A text is a, is a linear substance. It's like a movie. It has a beginning, a middle, of an end. Okay. Um, however, uh, um, uh, hypertext, the information is purely in the links. Okay. Um, uh, it comes back to this definition problem. Before, Bill mentioned the question of what is society, okay? And uh, with the neural network question, you have the question of what is mind, what is brain, what is consciousness? How does it arise out of all these kind of simple things? Where is it? If I point a gun at, uh, at your head and I shoot a hole through a, a thousand cells, which one of you, which cell do I have to shoot to kill the brain? It's like, before that, people thought the brain was just, oh yeah, in your head there's lots of small guys who actually run around doing different jobs. It's like, so which one of the, so there's a head guy, and I can shoot the head guy in your brain, and then that will kill you. Right, okay, so well, how does this head guy work? He has a brain. Ah, well, <laughs> how does that work? Okay. Clearly there's a contradiction there, but there was a contradiction that no one could actually resolve in favour of a better idea. Ted Nelson's concept of hypertext is what is a text? A text is a collection of links, and in fact the information is in the links. Okay? With a neural network, um, the axions actually have different levels of activity and they fire in, uh, in response, in different levels of response. They're differently sensitive. And so effectively, the intelligence is the summation, the emergent property that comes out of all, all, all these things. For Ted Nelson, he thought that all knowledge was the emergent effect of all the links between all the various hypertext documents. So effectively, the internet for him would be this emergent uh, 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 linkage of information. Bah. Okay, so uh, this is supposed to be a hierarchical view of the same concept. But to flatten it, um, to, to flatten any part portion of knowledge is to actually get rid of certain links. Um, there was a, uh, the guy who invented hypertext originally in the 40s, whose name I've just forgotten, um, uh, Bush, yes, Bush, he actually said in the future there will be uh, people whose job it would be to, to be guides. And they will actually create pathways, narratives through various hyper, hypertextual links to form effectively more interpretable stories. And so when we talk, we actually flatten out our ideas to actually form hypertextual stories and uh, non-hypertextual stories. Okay, so what happened with um, Ted, Nel uh, Ted Nelson's work was you ended up being lost in cyberspace. You'd be, uh, if you go, uh, you know, people rarely these days start from a home page and start keep clicking. Okay? Now, if it did, there were some interesting concepts that emerged in this. Have you ever heard of these factors known as things like the, uh, the Kevin Cosner Kevin factor? Have you heard of this? It's like, um, what is this particular star's Kevin Cosner factor? And what they do is they say, okay, well, um, if you were in the same film as Kevin Cosner, you have a Kevin Cosner factor of one. Okay, so what happens about this person? Well, they were in a film where the director was also directed a film by Kevin Cosner.
Okay, so that has, this actor's got a Kevin Cosner factor of two. Yeah? And, and so the idea is that any star can be given a Kevin Cosner factor. Okay? And in fact, you can choose any particular character you like. You can choose any kind of film actor. Now, everyone would have a particular um, Bob Hoskins factor. Okay? You might have, again, heard of this term uh, in popular uh, uh, law as um, seven degrees of freedom. Yeah? Has, any, has anyone heard of seven degrees of freedom? Just convince me I'm not really going off the edge here. <laughs> Seven degrees of separation, yeah? Right, good. At last, the film has been useful. Okay, the idea of seven degrees of separation, for those of you who haven't heard of it, is that if uh, uh, you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone to seven degrees, seven degrees of separation, and that would basically take in the entire population of America. So an American knows every other American by seven degrees of separation. Yeah? Um, now, that's actually quite an interesting concept because uh, before, Bill showed the picture of London. And what's interesting about the picture of London is that there are eight degrees of separation. Basically, on average, um, you are eight steps away, eight changes of direction away from every other street in London. Okay? Now, what I'm positing now is that uh, the two concepts are not unlinked. The two concepts are not that different. Before, Richard was talking about the concept of the transpatial society, the society that... Uh, ooh, next frame. Um, I'll go... Actually, I'll put another one in. Um, the transpatial society. The transpatial society is, for instance, the societies created by people that use muds and moos. Now, a mud and a moo is a textual space. You go to it, and each space is actually described in loving text. And in fact, we even had a short project uh, with, with Bitstream where the students actually created an, uh, an, uh, an AA mud. Right. Uh, and in that, you can actually go from one room to the next. And one of these, what's interesting about the nets is you actually find these places are actually incredibly popular. You actually find lots of people. Okay, what happens is you end up with 300 people in the kitchen or 40 people sitting on the sofa. But uh, uh, what they're doing is they're actually kind of taking over the, um, taking, uh, taking over the world and actually using them for primary social activities. Okay? So I, I think Ruth was actually on one. What, what, what did you say about it? You were on um, Alpha World. And at the end of it, you goes, oh, I've got to go and, off and have lunch. And someone goes, oh, that's good. I need to go and get breakfast. And someone else said, oh, that's useful. I need to go to bed. Right? She was actually forming transpatial social relationships. Um, but what's interesting about them is, uh, A, they were formed in the background of space, which may or may not be just um, a, a temporary transitional phase. Again, as Richard was saying, you, you get these transitional phases. We have um, wireless becoming radio. We have the horse's carriage becoming the the car. And of course, as objects exist in, um, uh, uh, by analogy, they exist poorly. You know, people were saying, horse's carriage, what do I want to buy a horse's carriage for? They're useless. It's like a proper horse and carriage, you can get drunk and it'll drive you home. Can a, <laughs> can a real horse and carriage do that? Can, a, uh, can your horse's carriage do that? No. It's obviously inferior. It's obviously some synthetic, artificial uh, uh, horse and carriage. It's obviously inferior to the real thing. Okay? Eventually, people regard it as the real thing, and therefore it gains a new name. This could well happen with the internet. Okay. However, <laughs> um, back to cyberspace being where you are when you're on the phone. One of the ways that syntax actually investigates the effect of space on uh, an organization is to actually map out the relationships between people. Okay. So, for instance, uh, uh, what they do is they go out and they, 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 say, they, they provide questionnaires saying, well, who do you know? Which, who do you know organisation do you find useful? And, they actually for, uh, and you actually see that most organisations form these quite interesting networks. Now, of course, uh, what is potentially interesting is you can actually perform the same kind of syntactical analysis on this, on these organisational uh, systems that you could actually do in real systems. Uh, in spatial systems. So, for instance, you could discover the who needs to be fired next. Okay? And in, in Bill's system, uh, in the map of London, you should have studied the map of London incredibly closely because what I'll point out is the fact it's not about centrality. People say, oh yeah, that's syntactical map, it's about centrality. Closer you are to Oxford Street, the hotter you are. Rubbish. 
what about there are certain streets of Oxford Street which are incredibly dead, and this is one of the kind of uh, proof positives of syntax being uh, a, a, an interesting phenomena is the fact that they are these dead spaces, even though they're really close to incredibly occupied space. Feel free to contribute to me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good, I uh, got away with that one. Um, okay, so si similarly, you can actually perform similar operations inside the company. You can actually say, well, who's the hottest? Who's the reddest person? Who is the person that's most central to, the, uh, uh, to this organisation? Equally, who's the most hanging on? Who's the bluest person in this whole organisation? They might be quite central. They might be quite close to the managing director, but they still could be pretty useless in terms of the whole organisational flow of information. So um, even though there were non... Um, uh, I, I think the concept of space syntax can actually be applied in much more general ways. Um, for instance, back to the uh, uh, t Nelson notion of cyberspace. Um, uh, with the notion of the notion of cyberspace, we can actually count who know, who, how many people use a particular web page. From, from counting that use of the web page, you can actually say this page is very busy, this page is very quiet. And I'm, uh, part of my PhD was actually studying whether or not it was possible to apply the notions of space syntax the, uh, to the concept of whether or not this page is used because it's heavily, because it's incredibly useful, or whether or not this page is used because it's actually, uh, it actually happens to be linked to all these other things with an incredibly low Kevin Cosner number. Um, <coughs> So, okay, finally, the, the, um, just to reiterate the bill stuff, um, very quickly, okay, this, is, uh, this was my attempt at doing a quick Kronzberg, uh, and here we see um, uh, a spatial analysis done by a piece of software I built called Space Inter uh, Spacebox. <laughs> yeah. um, in here, what the program does is it actually tries to discover every space in the system, and it does that by defining a space as a convex lump. Like, we're in a convex space here, you're in a convex space there, but you two can't see each other, so you're not in uh, a, one single convex space. Similarly here, right, this is a single convex space. All the space syntax program does is find the convex spaces and then turns them into a network, okay, and then performs the syntactical analysis, the analysis that Bill described earlier, as that. Um, now, <coughs> I'm going to conclude by saying... What makes graphs interesting, and what makes cities interesting for me, is the fact that the graph itself is such a counterintuitive object. Um, for instance, one interesting property is, typically when you add things to something, they get bigger. If you add food to people, people get bigger. If you <laughs> 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 um, However, graphs, graphs generally have this property. If you add a street to London, the, num the, the length of all the roads in London would go up slightly. Agree? Okay. Ooh, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I managed to worry you enough. Okay, so suppose you have three cities connected by an internet connection. Okay? Now, going back to this concept of, and um, this is the last sentence, so going back to this concept of the economy of the gift. Okay? Um, now, what would happen if someone came along and said, oh, uh, we're a city and we want to be joined to your network? Okay, you go, oh, well, we'd have to lengthen the network and we're going to charge you for that increase in length. Okay, now if that happens to you, it's, it might be worth saying yes, because in this particular case, if you were near the centre of, um, of those three cities, by adding in a link, by adding in a new city, you actually shorten the overall length of the network. Okay, so in theory, the, the city should be a page to be added to it. And this is something that arises out of the network, the internet, very often. The more people use it, the more capacity there is, the cheaper the individual uh, network connection becomes. So eventually, theoretically, you end up with an infinitely zero, uh, a zero cost when you have everyone using it. Okay. So it's not, a, it's not an exclusive um, form of economics, it's an inclusive form of economics. Um, okay, but this is a property of networks that's actually very interesting, and yet completely counterintuitive. Uh, and that's it, I've finished. <laughs> Well, I think did, uh, Sheep did admirably there to, uh, to sort of manage to do that at top speed. Uh, what I'll actually do now is invite all the speakers to take the floor, and then if anyone has any questions, uh, we can have a brief questions and answers session. Um, I think we moved some
Yeah. 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 So, um, does anyone feel brave enough to kick off? This is always the bit I hate most. So, uh, any, any, uh, anyone absolutely dying to ask a question here? I think uh, one of the things that's always interested me is, um, and, and I'm not sure quite how to phrase this as a, bound, as a question, but it's to do with the blurring of boundaries. The thing I'm really interested in at the moment is uh, the impact of the real on the virtual and the impact of the virtual on the real. And what we've had today is, um, uh, this evening is, um, I, I actually think the three talks actually hang together very well. Um, but. Uh, really can't express this as a question. But do either of the speakers tonight actually foresee uh, sort of moving forward uh, in such a way that the real and the virtual, the boundaries between them begin to get more blurred? I mean, they are very blurred at the moment. The concept of money is virtual. Hmm. It's, not, it's not real. It's not an asset. It is. You don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, pra it's practically real, but it's not, you know, it's like, it's Social relationship between people. Yeah, social. Can I argue with Richard? Feel free, great. About the idea that what is new is, is overcoming space. Um, I didn't say that. I said it's a long term process. Well, according to my analysis, I mean, societies are how they overcome space from the word go. There's not in the past some bunch of guys who live in a face to face contact and some, somehow something has happened. Uh, I mean, the whole technology of society and how societies reproduce themselves and create these things which occupy vast realms and yet, you know, with virtual structures and yet seem to sort of stabilize themselves or I evolve in a kind of an ordered way over a, over a long period is, is to do with the technology of overcoming space. Yeah. Things like rituals are techniques for overcoming space because they take people who are dispersed under, under normal conditions and bring them together uh, and enact certain things and then redisperse them again. Now it seems to me that, in, in that sense, that we sh the way what really interests me about the internet is, is not so much that this is that th this is a new technology for overcoming space, certainly, but that's nothing new about society. What is really interesting about the internet is how people use it. Uh, for example, um, one of the things about how human groups interact is that the is that the when, where you have small groups who cohabit in within the same spatial domain habitually. You use a short code. You use informal language. You develop um, ways of contact which literally sort of have the formal properties of, of lacking formality. Um, whereas if you communicate at, at a larger scale, I mean, letters, for example, typically have a, a great deal of formality attached to them. You say, dear so-and-so, and you say, I, I assure you of my distinguished sentiments, if you're French. And everyone has an elaborate way. And basically, there's a relationship between space and formality. La the, the more space you overcome, the more formally you tend to construct the inter interface of relationships, if you like, and that's one of the fundamental things about society. What's really interesting about the internet is it operates on what I call a short model, on a short code. It's an informal model of contact. It's this that I think gives it its dynamics and makes it most interesting. The point you, that you made it is that it, it's structureless. And that means it's working, if you like, a, like a group which has become habituated to itself in space and therefore becoming informal. So for me, the internet is interesting, pre precise, not because it's for the first time something which overcomes space in society, because societies were, were never that simply related to space, but because it's the first technology which overcomes space in the sense of rendering, if you like, trans space informal. I think that's, that's, that's the most telling thing about the kind of community it's creating. With a telegraph message. No, what is a telegraph message? Well, the first real time communication to distance was telegraphs, because you had to do the charge by the word. Mm. Actually, they were massively important. They <coughs> lots of sugar and cash. Yes, of course. And I mean, all this is basic information theory. I mean, but I'm talking about not, not short code in the, in the sense of, you know, sort of um, in, in the information theoretic sense. I'm talking about 
um, uh, informal ways of contact, eliminating, if you like, certain kinds of redundancy. Well, I don't think you can read off the technology how people behave, because actually it depends what sort of groups they're talking to. So if somebody invites me, I don't know, like yesterday I got invited from the university abroad, and they sent me an incredibly formal email. Um, but other people, when they send their friends, I think they send me emails, they're often misspelt and but send the gibberish because they know that I know what they're talking well, about. No one and I think, I think that's, in a sense, I think you're confusing the technology with the social relationships between people. And the good thing about the net, as I was trying to say, is precisely that you can create these very intimate groups at great distance. I mean, well, but that's not, that's not a new phenomenon. We've had posting systems since the beginning of modernity. We've had real-time communication since the middle of the last century. What's interesting is what happens when it's ubiquitous. And particularly when actually people can do, th you know, the great effort of constructing, of distributing and producing uh, information in this century has been the electronic media, but it's been overwhelmingly a one-way flow from certain groups to the mass of the population. The promise of the net is precisely that everybody can broadcast. Uh, Bertel Brett was asked, what did he think of radio after he made a few radio plays? He said it would be very good technology if everybody had a transmitter. And it strikes me that this is the great promise of the net. It's it will give everybody a transmitter. Although, I mean, that said, um, uh, there was a very interesting technology, the first um, Edison phonograph. Uh, to talking in terms of technologies that change names. Um, when it first came out, uh, every phonograph was capable of recording and transmitting. Um, it was one. You know, have you seen the cylindrical ones? Rather than the flat discs, they actually had cylindrical ones. And uh, Edison said it's great. And he goes, in the future, what happens is you'll sit there and you dictate to your phonograph. It will record, and then you put the cylinder in a box, and then you'll send it off to the person that's going to listen to it, and then they'll listen to it like a letter or a message. And what happened after a while was that. Um, started to do when they received it is they started to sit, stand around and sing songs into it to actually chest out recording it. And what happened was to, Edison always had this notion of that's how the technology would be used. It would be used as a form of communication between businessmen. But what actually happened eventually was that people started to then, uh, the Victor Phonograph Company came along and they actually said, okay, well this cylinder stuff is really difficult and it's very difficult to mass produce things like this. And what people seem to want is they seem to want to record speech and record music. So what we'll do is we'll actually invent a slightly different technology that partially is very easy to use. The, the original quotes on the original phonograph were, it takes two weeks to learn to use this record player, but after that, it's worth the effort. It's like, and that's actually quite interesting. It's the idea that, oh, wow, two weeks to learn to use a record player. It seems like, you know, sort of quite strange. But um, uh, eventually, um, it turned into a broadcast medium. So it started off, it could have been colonised, but it didn't become colonised. Patrick, yeah. um, I find the whole kind of area of research incredibly exciting and important, and it has been influential not only in architecture, but also in, you know, connected to the whole kind of social theory, discourse network theory, etc. And um, also the, uh, the need to incorporate this kind of level of Logical reflection, like, like, like um, uh, exhibiting. I think uh, I want to bring in, um, hook on to this discussion with the physical space structure, structuring society. You refer to refer to the way modern society is, 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 is like every society is structured in space and through space, and um, and uh, try to elaborate what how. How uh, the internet might have similar constraints or or, or structuring um, if, uh, parameters. I want to bring in a point which I uh, was very explicitly made by Anne Penn, one of your colleagues. The way he is um, describing the city fabric um, as a kind of um, social memory. And I want to elaborate a little bit. The way you started to talk about the structuration theory. The question how a kind of uh, atomized uh, kind of individuals in, in their kind of traffic patterns create kind of recursivity or, or order of repetition, uh, which then is kind of called structure. How space might form a fundamental role in that. 
as something which has a degree of permanency, which is kind of honed and, and, was, and, and, and of carved over generations and accumulates and creates something emergent beyond the individual. How that is then uh, also, once you have kind of, it's interesting that you say Anton Gerhard society is much more flux, is much less stable, but it's also at the same time not progressing. Change is not equals progress, that the, the settlement the establishment of walls and territories, etc., sets up the trajectory of progress, and it also includes hierarchy, suddenly limits and, and partitioning off, stratification, and, and, and architecture is profound and fundamental. Also, in establishing what we later become it comes to tools of thinking, what Foucault calls discursive relations, wall distinctions, orders of subsumptions are like walls within walls, distinctions are walls, etc. And, and I think that um, that becomes an extremely important insight that, that societies build these cities and this is the only way you see societal and civilizations emerge and that the city fabric becomes this kind of, let's say, collective memory as it were, of, of, the, of, of industrial civilization still. And uh, one wonders, um, when you talk about that the electronic media is misunderstood because it clings to spaces. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's some, let's say, I think, uncooked kind of ambiguities there. I think, first of all, that um, it is obvious that the meta-architectural metaphor is not discouraged by talking about real space distances all the time. That's true. But what I, where I found a key point there, that you seem to say, so it's no longer a space in the political, in the kind of limiting of access and kind of in the way it establishes order and hierarchy there where we become interesting. If that is taken away because these electronic agoras are no longer like limited, bound and and and, and etc. But the final question arising out of that is is that absence in a sense where, where does that lead as it were as a kind of utopian projection if if it is, you seem to say, is there a lack of order? Is there, is, is there a, lack of, a lack of resistance, a lack of material kind of consciousness? Because what we have learned to realize that material uh, consciousness is inherently material in, in the sense of the way. There's two points there. There's a philosophical point, which is that structuralism has a key methodological problem, which is it's ahistorical, or anti historical. So it has real problems in analyzing how human society works. So there's an absolute basic for the software. But as for the you know, about the is the net free of spatial restrictions, what I was trying to say is that that was, is that actually the spatial restrictions are the fact that the net has become reintegrated into really existing society. So that one of the ideas was precisely that the electronic aggregate, both in the new left of the 70s and in this latest version of the virtual community, is somehow a perfect space, a space that's outside society. And I think one of the interesting things is a lot of the work that's been done in the last few years about <coughs> network communities is precisely to see that they are part of people's life, like the telephone, like the television. And yes, we can say, you know, one of the things that constructs our national identity is that we watch the BBC News. Yeah? But it doesn't mean that somehow that, you know, that somehow the television has become outside our society. It's somehow it's integrated. The very power of television is precisely it reinforces political and economic institutions that exist. And one of the things about the, these new network communities emerging is that they actually cut with some of these practices. And the gift of common seems to be absolutely classic example of this. The way that something that was seen as, you know, anarcho communism, radical, ultra left wing, is now completely banal. Circulating gifts to each other and information is completely banal. In, in ordinary society, the gift economy exists inside the money economy anyway. I mean, you know, we work for a living all week and we get paid for it. Then we go out on Saturday night and we, you know, we, we give it all away. We buy, we buy drinks. We don't try and make profit out of I mean, the gift economy is permanently in society. It is the way in which we behave in our everyday lives, you know, within the context of a larger money system. It seems to me not seeing a transition from one to the other. The internet, but I'm still not clear. Are you saying the internet is in society or a kind of an ideal alternative to it? Well, it's not clear and I wasn't clear and I don't think our friend here is clear either. <laughs> what, what are you, you're critiquing what? 
the view that it's becoming part of society, or? No, the other way around. I think it's, it's not something outside. I mean, it's interesting that coming back to You're saying it's what, not we said, what we said earlier on about, you said that it, it, it's real or virtual. And actually, I know most people I know say, well, actually being in, looking at web pages, being in a network community is real. Why is it any less real than sitting in a pub talk? I want to look, it's a very strange idea that, to think that it's less real if you talk to somebody through a telephone or through a net connection than if you do this to appeal. But you communicate with people when they're not there. They I are mean, there. They are there. That's, well, a, that's I, the whole point no, of the no, I'm, 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 I'm saying something else. You communicate with people. For example, when you're in your own home and there's nobody else there, the, the decor, the way you, you know, organise your space expresses something about you which is profoundly social and about profoundly about social membership even though the members of the members of society other than your family to whom this is addressed aren't going to see it and aren't available we communicate independent of space anyway a great deal of what we do is about being social members not just by physically contacting people this is why i say that to understand society you have to understand that society is not just made up of face-to-face -face relationships it's made of the means by which we overcome space Architecture illustrates this perfectly. Building illustrates this perfectly. How we use buildings both to relate in space but also to relate independent of space for the way in which we organize and express culture through buildings. This is what I try to show in looking at interior domestic space. The very plan of the building, if you like, encodes and organizes within the, 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 the domestic domain, if you like, uh, a, a way of living which is like other members of that society. And so your membership, if you like, is in spite of the war between you and them. So I think, I think none of these things are quite that new. But you did, you did ask a, a very important question early on about, about how space plays a role in society. And I think, I think that what you said need, needs an impo a very important clarification. Because society is realized in space in two ways, in, in spatio-temporally. One is in patterns of humor and interaction. And the study of these is really only just beginning. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, so many of our, our, our activities follow the pattern I described in a very primitive society, where in small groups for some of the time, and in much larger groups from others, and we exchange people. This kind of mechanism and shuffling of people is, is, is very, very common. But it seems to me that the fundamental question is that if we think of ourselves as organisms, as forms, you know, we know how we happen, we know about DNA, we know about genetic information, you know, we know where the, the DNA is, it's inside, it's encoded in every cell, so, and so we say, well, where's the social DNA? How do these things go on evolving through centuries and stabilizing and declining and all these things, but in a kind of a regular pattern? Where is the social DNA? Is it in our heads? Is it in our bodies? I say it's in spatio-temporal realization. That is where it is. It's by constructing it in the spatio-temporal world. That is the means by which structures are carried forward. Just as in language, we have a certain picture of language in our head, but a language dies unless it is continually re-embodied in space-time by being spoken and by being heard and by being exchanged. Now, it seems to me that makes a very important distinction between if you what we might call the, the, in, the interaction dimension of society. Interaction is the means by which, if you like, the, the Giddens virtual structure is actually projected into the future and reproduced. However, the, the fixed space of the spatio-temporal world, the city if you like, is a constant attempt to fix the background space if you like, to in accordance with the thing that we're reproducing. So it continually evolves and changes, but at a much slower rate. So the, the, although I hope my map showed that the the, the street grid of London is not just an inert thing, it's a, it's a historical record of a living process, but it is constantly changing and it's, con it's continually behind the game, if you like, in terms of how the, the vital stuff of the social DNA being reproduced through social interaction, and there's always a kind of an approximate background. This is where, if you like, the lawfulness of space comes in, because there are certain, if you like, ways of doing space which fit most things. I mean, for, for, for example, for generating more interaction or for restricting it. There are, there are certain basic strategies. And by and large, cities do one thing in one part and another in another. So it fits one generation, and with small ad adaptations, fit the next, because you know, the relation of society and space is, is more generalizable. I mean, you know, we, we, we still use the cities of mercantile capitalism for, for the, the forms of the industrial city and the post-industrial city in, uh, up until the, the, the very recent time. 
So I think the, it's very important to make a distinction between the fixed stuff of space, if you like, and the spatio-temporal realization of society. The relation between the two is very important, and the one is meant to support the other, but it's always behind the game, and it's always got a history. How do you think society can exist other than space and time? I think it probably can't. I think that... So uh, it's a banality, what you want to say, like most of what he says. Well, it... it that, 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 that seems to be a... a well, a facile observation, if you don't mind me saying so. Because I was taught by him for years, and I think this is... Well, I, know, I, know, I, I, know, I never had that pleasure. <laughs> but it's a pleasure, I can assure you. I mean... But well, it's, it is, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, yeah, we exist in space and time. What does it mean? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You, you, you weren't listening when he was teaching you. Let me tell you what he's actually saying. <laughs> he is trying to say, where is the social DNA? Where is the, where is the, the information, if you like? I mean, you know, a society is not a physical system. It works on information. Where is the information? Where is the DNA? You go and look at the tube at 9 o'clock in the morning and see people physically crushed together going to some job. Yes, I know, but you've got the spatial illusion that you're thinking that people are only together when they're crushed together. I'm talking about how societies overcome space is what they are. And there are various techniques by which this is done right from, right from the word go, about aggregating, exchanging people, all these techniques, turn, if you like, a collection of individuals into something which can reproduce the structure. Now, uh, I dislike Giddens' <coughs> jargon and his language enormously, and he embeds certain very fundamental points, I think, in an enormous clutter of sociological nonsense. <laughs> but at the same time, no, I don't think so. I think the, I think the notion that, uh, that, the, that the realization in space-time as a mean by which society has reproduced itself is a far-reaching theoretical proposition. He doesn't quite formulate it clearly, I don't think, but I, you know, or clearly enough, but I think this changes the basic, you know, epistemology of sociology and would have gone farther if people had found ways of saying that in a more formal way and in a more powerful way other than in the rather overgeneralized language he's using. I, 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 he I, does have deliberately because he doesn't want to confront any social or historical problems. He's a terrified of them. Well, he runs away from it. Well, I'm not going to argue about the Giddens layer here. I'm, I'm taking certain points from Giddens as, a, as an attempt to try to take the the, the, the dreadful state that social, social theory is in, um, and in particular, uh, to raise the, he tries to raise the question of what is the relationship between this abstraction we call society and space-time, and he is not simply saying that society is realized in space. He's saying that the realization in space is what society is because it's how it reproduces itself. I'm trying to clarify certain things, he says, by using analogies with other kinds of strongly relational systems to show that I think you can develop a, a rigorous approach to this kind of virtual structure and show that there is something hard and real that is reproduced through space. I, th I think if we make this one the last question, yeah. and uh, before Patrick asks it, <laughs> I would just like to thank uh, everyone who's still in the audience for persevering. This has been quite a marathon uh, run. And uh, to basically say any more questions, I think we'll continue this up in the bar. So, Patrick. <laughs> I just wanted to say that it's an incredibly exciting research book when you map out. And I truly believe that there is a fundamental you know, paradigm shift and key to a contribution to social theory. Yeah. And, and that's why I find architecture an exciting place to be in these kind of uh, research. Nevertheless, I have one kind of remark about, and I think the tools you've been creating through the space syntax set of tools is so focused and, 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 um, and, and conclusive that I'm, that I, the only question I have is um, the, there are so many more tools to be discovered. I mean, there's a kind of, for me, it's a closed set and I see the productivity in the world kind of community of space syntax researchers now. And it's a kind of product I need to see, for instance, it's obviously not only graph theory, which you can reduce this to. It's not only kind of homogenous sets of points and the links between there is of course a very important thing. Mm. Typology still. The, the notes have a totally different kind of, uh, there's a whole series of categories which are waiting to be brought into that kind of uh, uh, network analysis. So they exist outside, but it's enormous research of course in terms of uh, 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 typological kind of. I tell you why the graph is important and why, you know, I've just actually, I've got a paper coming out in a, in a month's time addressed exactly to this problem, why the graph, okay? And it's because 
because we discover in looking at space, space has intrinsic properties in Gibbons terms, system properties, the things we see, the things we experience, you know, the things we're very conscious of, you know, the impact space makes on us is all about the intrinsic properties of spaces, yes? And yet research shows it's the extrinsic network properties of spaces that are actually vital. Can I say something? Oh, hang on, hang on. Sorry. Sorry. And, and, and the, crucial, the, the crucial thing is that it's only by using the graph and treating the thing as pure relations that you can build the, what I call the non-local picture of the system, the picture of the system from the point of view of all the other elements. As soon as you begin to complicate the elements, you tend to lose that kind of Absolutely relational information. Absolutely because morphology is another virtual system. There are systems of affiliation morphologically, typologically, these are, you know, Spati spatial type systems, they have the same degree of virtuality. You're limiting to the, to the, to the kind of geometric, geographic relational, uh, uh, relationality, as it were. That's what I would say. It's not intrinsic versus external. There's as much as kind of dependent on a total network of type morphologies which have, which, have, which have an operational kind of, yes, complication, but it's a system, com it's a complex of these complications. That's what I want to point out. And that, 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 you give a lot of incredible keys to... to, 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 to have, you talked to Phil, have you talked to Phil Stemmen about this? No. <laughs> you might find it interesting. <laughs> I've got road in our place. I want to hear Richard's point. <laughs> what? I want to hear your point. It sounds like it's good. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, it's just, I just find it interesting as somebody who's trying to see story that you can try and use these basically a historical theories to talk about something that's a social historical <coughs> creation. I'm sorry, uh, so a can complete I can... tribe. I'm sorry. <laughs> Space syntax is widely used I'm in not... historical analysis I'm and historical not... diagnosis. Can I, can I, can it adds a new dimension to history. Can I finish? Right. And I think, I think this is what I find interesting if you don't investigate, you know, we talked about the construction of the net, and you can only, one, one of the ways you have to understand it is not just theoretically, but also as a historical phenomenon. And it seems to me that's always the problem. You know, if you evacuate, Gittin's being a good example, having been taught by him, is you evacuate history. And so I would say, don't read Anthony Gittin's, read Henri Lefer. That would be my choice as then. I think we'll draw the line there. <laughs> so, uh,